African-American legends highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, and business. We will explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they have been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr. Joining me on today's program is Thomas Clark, President and CEO of Carver Federal Savings Bank, the largest African-American bank in this country. Uh, Tom, so glad to have you with us today to talk about banking in the African-American community, because that's where the action is, I assume. Uh, could you begin by telling us something about the origin and the history of Carver Federal Savings Bank? Uh, well, first of all, we're delighted to be here, and we'd like to commend and thank you. Uh, Carver Federal Savings Bank started as a savings and loan association 47 years ago. Now, what is a savings and loan association? A savings and loan association is an association. Now we're a bank. An association at that time, for all practical purposes, was set up as a savings loan to do housing, to finance mm -hmm. strictly housing uh, in the country, mortgages, et cetera, and savings, mm -hmm. savings accounts. Of course, in the earlier days, uh, from the earlier days, much more sophisticated and complex now. But we started operation on George Washington Carver's birthday, as I understand it, mm -hmm. on January the uh, 5th, 1948, is when the bank actually started. We were chartered in 1947. So uh, we say this is our 47th year. Who were your year. founders? Well, one of the uh, founders is uh, still alive today, the Reverend Dr. Moran Weston, St. Philip's Church, uh, also uh, Mr. William Hudgens, mm -hmm. who later went on. There was a lady, I can't think of her name, and there were uh, as I understand it, there were six or seven original directors, mm -hmm. two of which are still alive today, and one is still active as vice chairman of the board, and that is the Reverend Dr. Moran Weston. And he's done a lot in housing himself through his church and through his organization. As I understand yeah. with St. Phillips, that's in correct. Phillips. He's done, a, he's built a lot, that church has built a lot of housing and really been involved in significant quality of mm -hmm. life issues, specifically in the Harlem community. It shows what money and leadership can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, the bank has recently uh, gone public. It's that is a, correct. a publicly owned bank now. Now, what is the status of the bank as a publicly owned bank? What are its resources? How does it do business, et cetera? Okay. Well, as I stated, we started as a savings and loan. <clears throat> then we became a federally chartered savings bank, still mutual, uh, around uh, about three years ago. Now, you're a banker. You used to run the New York State banks. But uh, when we talk to the general public, they don't understand these I'm divisions gonna, right. between savings association, mutual, <laughs> and federal yeah. banks. So yeah. tell us a little about well, that. When they, be, when they went from becoming a savings and loan to a savings bank, the, the, which is co technically called a thrift industry. The thrift industry is, is primarily a grouping of savings banks, savings and loan associations, and credit unions. That's what you call a thrift. As uh, differentiated from a commercial bank that is, does credit cards and loans and things Correct. like that. Correct. Commercial bank, commercial loans. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to basically identify. But now, don't they get into mortgages and so on? Aren't uh, they crossing into your business with the new changes in banking? Uh, you're really on top of it. Yes, it's, it's a new world now, it's a, uh, Dr. Brown. It's an entirely new world. We went public in October 24th of 1994, and we're the first African-American uh, financial institution in this country that's listed on any one of the major stock exchanges in America. Which exchange are you on? We're on the NASDAQ. NASDAQ. We're on the NASDAQ exchange. Uh, as you know, there have been a number of efforts, a number of players in the financial service industry that have attempted this, and this is a tribute uh, to the uh, directors of the bank, uh, uh, namely uh, Mr. Richard Green, who's my predecessor as chairman, Dr. Weston, who was a predecessor as the chairman, is now vice chair, and of course Richard Green is the chairman now, and David Jones and Herman Johnson and the late uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Watkins, uh, who was, uh, I was very close to, who passed, as you know, uh, very recently. Uh, what they accomplished is a book in itself. I mean, they had obviously had to cr dot every I and cross every T, and it's a, it was a monumental effort and a very historic effort. Yet and I say this because some, this was before me. Yeah, but you've got some criticism for that. Now, what is the basis of that? I happen to support it, as you well know. Yes. But what is the basis of the criticism? Well, the criticism is what we say, what we consider to be frivolous. I was responsible in my other life as to why Carver was criticized, being a regulator. Mm -hmm. It all stems from the uh, Greenpoint Savings Bank. When Greenpoint was going uh, public and it was a 
state chartered institution. Of course, Carver is a federally chartered, so the New York State Banking Department does not regulate Carver. But the implications of that, and it was just at that time, uh, then superintendent, a uh, gentleman you know, Derek Cephas, and I was secretary to the banking board, uh, had some grave concerns, and he was correct, that the depositors were not benefiting enough in the conversion as much as they should have. Mm -hmm. uh, quite frankly, it appeared that the directors were getting a little too much money uh, at the uh, disadvantage or disservice of the depositors. So we, we passed some very strict regulations to bring that back in a check that the federal regulators basically uh, copied or adopted. And at that particular time, Carver was going public. And Carver, just unfortunately, was not in that category of a green point. I like to emphasize that and, uh, and as strong as I can. Mm -hmm. Carver was not a green point. It's just that the climate at the time. Mm -hmm. So when Carver went public on October 24th, 1994, it got caught up in that particular motion or just the, uh, at that time. So when they went public, when the your initial public offering was $10 a share, well, my God, when Carver went in this all or the climate that was created, the stock went down uh, to under just around $6 a share. So, of course, there was a great deal of concern. Uh, those were the hot money people. Uh, I said they took a, a loss if they were not able to get out quickly before mm -hmm. while the stock dropped. This is why I say when you buy stock in a bank like Carver or any bank, you should buy it for the long mm -hmm. term. Stocks go up and stocks mm -hmm. will come down and they will also pay a dividend. That's almost true for most stocks in one sense. That is correct. Unless you expect that to is turn correct. over a quick We stock. had a number of individuals, uh, Dr. Brown, who purchased, and this happens in all savings banks, commercial banks, uh, when they go public. These are individuals who open an account with a very minimal amount of money to take advantage of an upswing which, uh, which they were experiencing historically in the price of stock. Most of the initial public offerings prior to Carver was around four savings banks in the entire country that got caught up in this climate at the time. Prior to that, there was a high run-up in the stocks. Mm -hmm. So the individual sophisticated investors made, made some money. Well, unfortunately, they haven't. But we would like to think uh, with the Carver family that uh, it is a good investment. And those who are in for the long haul will do very well. Mm -hmm. More significantly, we're in the process of building Carver into the true original urban community development bank. And I like to underscore that because banking and community banking are two separate things. As you, mm -hmm. as you well know, one who's steeped in the community and has a great deal of concern historically in that area, it's very important that we get this message across that we are in the process of building an urban community development bank. Okay, now give an example of how an urban community development bank uh, works in the urban community as differentiated from some other banks who are not as much concerned okay. with that. Carver's <coughs> tradition, Carver came into being because African American or blacks 47 years ago could not bank. I mean you could probably, the best you could expect from a bank years ago was maybe to get an auto loan. But you were not able to get mortgages, we were not able to get basic lending. Plus we were not respected, we were di totally disrespected. So Carver's existence forced uh, the major banks, the other savings bank, commercial banks, to treat us more as customers uh, uh, with respect, with dignity, and opening up the lending field somewhat. As you know, unfortunately, recent data statistics have confirmed that we still have a long ways to go before African Americans are treated like uh, non-African Americans or blacks when they come into a bank, specifically as it relates to mortgages. Uh, well, when you come to That's Carver, you don't have to worry about the color of your skin uh, if you don't get a loan with us, what we will do is uh, we will refer you to budget and credit counseling service. If it's underwriting, if it's credit, you go through their program, you come back to Carver and we'll make the loan. So what I'm saying is that's the ability to help. Where our offices are located, we have eight branches. We have three offices in Brooklyn, two in Manhattan, two in Queens, and one, one in Roosevelt, Long Island. These are areas that banks don't normally want to operate in. Forget the advertising. We were there before the Community Reinvestment Act, which is better known as CRA, and I dealt with that in my other life. We, we didn't have to be forced to lend. By virtue of the communities that we operate in, operate in, they're coming back. A lot of federal dollars are going in these communities. A lot of self-help organizations. Carver is the church lender. We're the bank that is showing the way and leading the way historically. We make the church loans. We know how to do it. Other banks are coming to us to find out how can they make the church loans. We look at churches as a community development. 
The other lenders traditionally would not make church loans, and most of them don't do it today. There's only a few, and we can show them how to do it, of course, with a fee. We're not just going to just do it, but churches in themselves are catalysts to developing community. So that's been our philosophy before they even had community development. Components to churches, I mean, a, a church that renovates or a new church is a spark in terms of revitalizing communities. So we understand the communities. Our people live in the communities, they work in the communities, and they've been historically involved. And I don't have to tell you, there's still a lot of work to be done, and Carver intends to play a role in that. Well, I, I believe that some of the financial institutions say that they will not lend in minority neighborhoods because they are fearful of the protection of their investment. They feel that there's not enough collateral. They feel that the people are not uh, responsible in paying off the loans. The, what I have read indicates that, if anything, African Americans are even more inclined to do that than the general population. Yeah, and then the question is, why yeah, is it then yeah. that banks would shy away from making prudent loans to somebody who has a job? Well, that's, that's very well stated. Some 15 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, one of your academic colleagues, if not mistaken, it's the University of Michigan, did a study. Their, uh, their Office of Business Administration did an extensive study, which confirmed what you just said, that proportionally in their data, uh, the blacks save proportionally more than any other ethnic group in America. Uh, uh, if you will look at most of the uh, major banks now, they have to set up special departments and that called community development departments, which really were urged by the Community Reinvestment Act. It took a federal act to force them to do what they should have been doing in terms of chartering, if you ask someone. Now, else. why is it that they didn't do it before? They, they claim it was prudent business, but some of us feel it was prejudice and stereotyping. If it wasn't prejudice, it was stereotyping based on, I would say, lack of information. Well, that's a very good question, uh, and, and your viewing audience should, should uh, I'm quite sure, pay attention to this because it's, it's so true. You will find that the lending portfolios, these banks, Johnny come late, these, no matter who they are, forget the advertising. The African American loans that they have in terms of mortgages, consumer loans, et cetera, probably are ranking in the higher echelon in their investment portfolio in terms of, of low defalcation, late payments, and the like. It's opportunity. It's something that Carver's known all along. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't forget, our institution has weathered uh, recessions and and the like, and we're still here, and we're a very sound and solid institution. So we do that kind of lending every day. So it's nonsense. It's just the fact that it will lead up that a lot of individuals will say, you just didn't want to make those loans. You didn't want the, want the people to come in, which is not rational. And it, and, it, and it leads to, say, the color of one's skin. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And we all know that when one tends to own property, own real estate, given the opportunity, they take care of it better. And the communities thrive. I mean, that's, that's a national pattern. Well, let me ask, if you uh, happen to have a client who is defaulting on a mortgage or a loan, what do you do that's different with them to help them to keep their property and at the same time meet the obligation that some of the other banks might not do? I would think because we don't have to set up a personal banking department. Uh, when you come to Carver, you're a human being, you're a person, and we treat you, everybody as personal bank. To be more specific in answering your question, it's counseling. It's tracking the loans, mm -hmm. staying on top of the loans, and, and sitting down with people. Mm -hmm. Our default rate, uh, we've had individuals, yes, we've had individuals we've had to take over a few properties. And, and, I mean, that's normal, but it's very rare. If you look at our data compared to the others, because you stay on top of it. And there's just the loyalty to people. When you, when you, if, you, if you grant them a mortgage and you got the savings account, you, you finance their kids' education, there's a loyalty with the institution. Mm -hmm. And in and, and those cases where you really have to go into and really stay on top of people, there are circumstances that can warrant. But people don't want to lose their property. Uh, and that's the last thing they want to lose. Plus, we don't want them to lose it either. Mm -hmm. So you work with people on top. Now, your philosophy is really a community-oriented philosophy, yet you've been a banker all of your life, and you've been working in the regulatory agency. What attracted you to come to Carver as the president and CEO? Well. You know, I, I know this may sound uh, like a, a theology, but it's something I truly believe. I've always tried to demonstrate, and I was raised and still believe that, you put your faith in God and not man. Uh, I've been trying to get to Carver since the early 80s. And I always say, the good Lord may not come when you want, but he'll always come on time. <laughs> and that's a fact. I may have thought I was ready in the early 80s, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked at Carver as an experience coming out of the municipal credit union 
I was a turnaround mm -hmm. situation I was mm -hmm. involved in, and uh, uh, the that's a, that's the bank for city workers and state workers yeah. that that work. So we were, it was a very successful effort. I got my first taste of running a financial institution. So I've been knowing uh, the uh, my predecessor since 1976 when I came down from Buffalo. This is my 25th year in banking, by the way. And uh, we struck a dialogue. We became pen pals. I'd send him information because, you know, we were in the banking department exposed to a number of things. So when I got back from the credit union, we talked about it, and uh, uh, things didn't work out. But lo and behold, when they went public uh, last year in 1994, uh, my executive assistant, uh, I was showing the article in the Times at the time that Carver had gone public. And this is a fact. She looked at me and she said, Mr. Clark, she said, you know, they need you at Carver. That's wonderful. They need uh, you at Carver. Young person again. You. Uh -huh. I said, I, I've talked to them. The timing wasn't right. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it. And um, uh, dialogue started from that point with uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Weston and also Mr. David Jones, who headed the search committee. And as fate would have it, uh, here I mm -hmm. sit, February 1 of this <laughs> uh, year. Let me ask uh, again, you're a banker. People come to you to support businesses and housing and so on. Not so much business, but mainly housing. Um, you have to say no sometimes. Yes. Uh, how does it feel when you have to do that, and what do you do to minimize the chances <laughs> of saying no? <laughs> well, first of all, you try to uh, have your ammunition, which is, is, is information on an individual and what they're trying to do. For example, uh, we will be, and we'll go into this, I'm quite sure, at any point you want, we will be one of about a handful of uh, savings banks in the entire state of New York that will shortly be granting uh, small business loans. Mm -hmm. We will, uh, by year ending 1995, have our own credit card. So uh, if a person comes to me by the time it gets to me, and of course they're, they're upset and they really want a loan, I have all the information. So I, and I, I, sit there, I talk to people on the phone and personally all the time. Mm -hmm. And you try to explain it to them. Most of the times you're successful where there's not too much anger. Uh, but I believe in being honest with an individual. One of the biggest disservices you can do is to, is to give someone a loan knowing that they can't afford it. That's uh, very That's clear. detrimental right. to them. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do not want to do. Mm -hmm. I see it, and what we do is we try to sway individuals to counsel it. I can, I can, we can look at the ratios. And we can do an analysis. So when I get it, I kind of know, and I try to steer. When you say the ratios, what do you yeah, mean? Yeah. Well, for example, the debt service is probably too high for the loan. In other words, they've credit cards and their way of life and their lifestyle just does not demonstrate that they have the ability to repay the loan. Mm -hmm. They may think that they do, but the information we have—I mean, I'm, we're looking at the income tax statements for the last three years. We're looking at their credit. They may have some charge-offs. They may have some situations there. That's a danger signal. Mm -hmm. The light goes on. And you say, this person is not a good credit risk at this particular time. So you don't, you know, you say no, but you say, look, why don't you get some counseling? Mm -hmm. If the person wants to go into business, we will send them to the Small Business Development Center, for example, uh, and they will look at the deal, they will look mm -hmm. at the situation, they'll advise them accordingly. So uh, it's, it's, it's a rarity where a person, you're saying no and they're not expecting it. Yeah. Well, they, that they relates then to something that I've heard some people in the African American community say, that banks like Carver have an obligation to take a risk on us. Uh, Carver does have a reputation of not doing foolish loans, and sometimes have been criticized for being, quote unquote, too conservative. Now, how do you balance out the need to uh, support African American business and property owners and the question of risk. How do you balance that out? It's very difficult. It's challenging, but that's what we get paid to do. Uh, this is why Carver's still in business. It's weathered recessions, and that's what we want. It's an institution steeped in urban New York, and you have to have a balance. It, you, the mission and role of a savings bank is most of our portfolio uh, has to be in mortgages. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has to be. Right. Now, that can be direct lending or mortgage-related type activity, which in like, for example, mortgage-backed securities, where we have bought some. We have been criticized public, but part of my educational art is to talk to people, talk to groups and organizations, and explain it. Now, most of the time, you're successful. Uh, 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 we have, though, demonstrated the, the, one, the record speaks. Those that you grant the loans to speak for you. Because they pay. They pay. Right. And, and, and it's, again, it goes back to quality of life issues, uh, community development. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and, and recognizing you want a viable community that would contributes to enhancing quality of life issues. It's private sector. We are in a for-profit business, not for profit. Now, the more for-profit we can do, the more profitable we become and will stay, the more we can give back to mm -hmm. not-for-profit organizations, mm -hmm. entities that are engaged in quality of life issues. And that's the goal. The larger we become, the more profitable we become, the more we give back to the communities that we do in terms of the lending as well as contributions to the community. Well, that's what I was about to say. Harvard is well known for its scholarship program. Uh, would you talk a little about that? Yeah, our scholarship program came into being 19, 10 years ago, and we've granted almost $400,000 worth of scholarships, an endowment that uh, my predecessors set up with the uh, just in, with an enlightened board, and they saw that uh, uh, the board, I mean, the bank contributes uh, contributed fifty thousand dollars for ten years, and the scholarships are granted off the interest. Mm -hmm. So this past year, we've granted forty-one scholarships mm -hmm. that range anywhere from three hundred to six hundred dollars mm -hmm. per student. So uh, we've been doing that for ten years. So it's giving something back in the service areas, and these are individuals who are depositors or have a relationship, financial relationship, their families rather, with the bank. I know Richard Green, your predecessor, says that the proudest day of any year is when he gives up those scholarships. Yes, yes. It's again, it's giving something back, uh, and plus, it's good for business too. Uh, it, it's it's twofold. It's a no it's a no lose situation. Uh, we do a a lot in terms of our officers in the bank and staff uh, involved in, in community organizations, which will be heightened. It's something I personally believe in and try to emulate myself. That if you're involved, you work for our bank. If you're an officer of the bank specifically you're expected to be involved in organizations in your respective communities. They could be youth organizations, they could be health organizations, they could be senior citizens organizations, Absolutely. educational organizations. Right, cross-section. And I, I think that's very, very positive, and I think that's part of the new trend, although this isn't new for Carver, because yeah. I know Dr. Moran Weston's been doing this practically all of his life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have most of our board members, as you know, most of them yourself have, uh, have been doing this for years. And, uh, I just believe if you're an officer of the bank, you should not only be in an organization, you should be actively involved in trying to be in a leadership role in, in an organization that's giving and dealing with quality of life issues. Now, the hardest question is what can a African-American-owned bank do to improve the overall economic activity in the African-American community? That's uh, mortgages, of course, but what are some other things that they can do, and what are some of your strategies for doing that? Okay. I would say fair lending. Uh, we're an African-American managed institution today. When you go public and individuals who own your stock, they're diversified. We know for a fact that some of the major institutional and investors in this country own a piece of Carver, mm -hmm. and we want that. I encourage that. I want everyone to own a, want a piece of, mm -hmm. of Carver, but recognizing the foundation in the rock. This bank was started by African-Americans. It's no different than the Bank of America was started by Italian Americans mm -hmm. and look at it today. The old Manny Hanny, which is now chemical, which one day with regulatory approval, maybe Chase, mm -hmm. was started by Irish Americans. So it's an evolutionary process. I mean, all ethnic groups and nationalities are deposit of carbon. It's just we're overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, we know that, are African Americans in turn. Now, more than just mortgages, what do we do? I think fair lending and treating individuals with dignity and respect goes a long way. So as I just stated earlier, we'll have our own credit card. We will also have be doing small business lending. Uh, that's an area we get a lot of inquiries now. And if you're talking about turning around, teaching individuals uh, the value of owning stock, we're in the business of creating wealth. As uh, the late Dr. Watkins told me before his death, uh, it's the movement of money, man. Keep the money moving. That means individuals get a piece of the money. Uh, that's what we need to be talking about. We're talking about economic empowerment. Then Carver is steeped in that and can play a role in terms of educating. Uh, we're in the process, you know, moving into a $5 million new corporate office, mm -hmm. which is right in the heart of the proposed mm -hmm. empowerment zone. We hope when that office, we're looking forward to objectively bringing in groups and organizations and talking about how to purchase stock, the value of owning stock. In other words, uh, having a piece of Carver, which is going to enhance, keep it in the families. I mean, you know, this stock one day will pay a dividend also. So we're mm -hmm. talking about empowering people, independence, taking care of oneself, the old basic philosophies that you've stood for all of your life, is what mm -hmm. Carver's all about. Well, it's interesting that uh, this uh, message that you articulate so well 
is not understood or articulated throughout the, our community. When we talk about economic empowerment, people just think that somebody, God, somebody will drop some money down and all of a sudden things are going to happen. And the one thing you didn't say, which one of your competitors say, you earn money the old-fashioned way, you work for it. And what you're describing is the process of working with money so that uh, uh, people in the African-American community can understand it more. That is correct. And there's such a difference between economic development and economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. the empowerment is like, uh, you know, you show a person how to fish. You know, you show a person how to create wealth, mm -hmm. how to manage their money. We're in a capitalistic society that we want to participate. But see, individuals are not doing what you're doing. The talk show hosts, basically, mm -hmm. that have programs geared to our communities. It's nice, as we stated earlier, you get so involved in emotional issues, reaction, when pragmatically and realistically, mm -hmm. let's talk about economic empowerment and how an institution that's been around for 47 mm -hmm. years and other financial institutions and other individuals that are trying to get our people to understand, African Americans mm -hmm. specifically, the, the movement of money, how it enhances your quality of life in America. Because we are Americans. Mm -hmm. and, and I just uh, uh, cannot commend you enough for what mm -hmm. you're doing. Enough of this is not done. Mm -hmm. We're talking about other issues. But the bottom line in America mm -hmm. is about dollars, economic development, economic empowerment, and understanding what that is. And if you don't have it, if you don't have it, you can almost forget it. You, you'll, be, you'll be regressing instead of progressing. I think your message is really that uh, in dealing with economic development, there has to be planning, there has to be a, a goal, there has to be communication, and then it has to be activation, which is what you do at Carver so well, of these plans and this communication. So again, I want to thank you for coming to visit with us on African American Legends. As we say, institutions are legends as well as individuals, and you're both. We've been talking with Thomas Clark, uh, President and CEO of Carver Federal Savings Bank, about the role of this wonderful bank in the African American community and the way it can assist economic development in the black community. Thank you, Russell.